Taiwan has also agreed to the most robust and intrusive inspections and transparency regime ever negotiated for any nuclear program in history. Iran and the IAEA uh, negotiated and concluded an agreement to deal with this issue of PMD. These documents are not public, but nonetheless, uh, we have been briefed on those documents. We know their contents. We're satisfied with them. Can you explain um, why uh, this arrangement with Iran using its own experts and equipment to investigate the site was deemed acceptable? We have full confidence in the IAEA and in the inspection regimen that they will establish and set up uh, to make sure that Iran cannot achieve nuclear weapons capability. We're very comfortable uh, with the arrangements. Well, there are a lot of lawmakers not comfortable with the arrangement, as the IAEA now apparently saying that Iran can do its own inspections of its own nuclear facilities. And there's a lot of reaction. The chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, releasing a statement late this afternoon saying international inspections should be done by international inspectors, period. The standard of anywhere, anytime inspection so critical to a viable agreement has dropped to when Iran wants, where Iran wants, on Iran's terms. Congress must now consider whether this unprecedented arrangement will keep Iran from cheating. This is a dangerous farce. A lot of reaction coming in. Let's bring in our panel. Jason Riley, columnist with The Wall Street Journal. Amy Walter, national editor for The Cook Political Report and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Charles, we led the show saying that critics thought at first this was a joke, but it wasn't, and nobody's laughing as the State Department tried to defend it today. Look, this is truly shocking because we're talking about the Parchin facility, which the Iranians have said will never be inspected, and that we have said had to be inspected because of the, the, the thought, sort of the suspicion, uh, everywhere that Parchin was used for Iran to test nuclear detonation devices. This is extremely serious stuff. We were assured that accounting for this activity was a sine qua non of this agreement. And now we know why the administration kept it secret. It kept it secret because nobody can believe that the inspection will be carried out by Iran itself. It will do, supply the inspectors, it will do the photography, it will do the sampling. So the administration now says Uli Heinen, who was the, the deputy director of IAEA for five years in charge of inspections, has said that he can think of no instance in which a regime was allowed to inspect itself. You know, Obama had said in April, this deal is not based on trust based on unprecedented verification. This is a deal with, it's obvious, when you see this kind of naivete and this kind of capitulation, you have to say to yourself that administration orders were a deal no matter what. The idea that if you oppose this, you favor a war, I think is preposterous. This is actually quite scandalous. All is want that Obama has not given them? It's, it's hard to see what's left. Uh, doing your own inspections for activities that you deny engaging in? It's, it, it's a joke. And trying to play this down as the administration has done is no big deal is ridiculous. Obviously it's a big deal, which is why they didn't want anyone to know about it. And it's also, let's keep in mind what Iran is going to get the moment they sign on this dotted line. hundred billion dollars in frozen assets will be turned over to them. Not, not to mention all the economic activity they'll get over the next 10 years, the billions that will come, what really galls people. And I think, you know, any self-respecting lawmaker that does not take a second look at this deal, assuming they didn't know about this, right. Which, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to think they will. I still, however, don't think that um, that Republicans have the numbers to block it. But to, to supporters' point, if not this, what? In fact, it's those hardliners who are most comfortable with the status quo. It's those hardliners chanting death to America who've been most opposed to the deal. They're making common cause with the Republican caucus. The majority of the Iranian people have powerful incentives to urge their government to move in a different, less provocative direction. 
incentives that are strengthened by this deal. So let me sum up here. When we carefully examine the arguments against this deal, none of them stand up to scrutiny. That may be why the rhetoric on the other side is so strident. I suppose some of it can be ascribed to knee-jerk partisanship that has become all too familiar. Rhetoric that renders every decision that's made a disaster, a surrender. You're aiding terrorists. You're engender endangering freedom. On the other hand, I, th I do think it's important to acknowledge uh, another more understandable motivation behind the opposition to this deal, or at least skepticism to this deal. And that is a sincere affinity for our friend and ally Israel, an affinity that, as someone who has been a stalwart friend to Israel throughout my career, I deeply share. When the Israeli government is opposed to something, people in the United States take notice, and they should. No one can blame Israelis for having a deep skepticism about any dealings with a government like Iran's, which includes leaders who've denied the Holocaust, embrace an ideology of anti-Semitism, facilitate the flow of rockets that are arrayed on Israelis, Israel's borders, or pointed at Tel Aviv. In such a dangerous neighborhood, Israel has to be vigilant, and it rightly insists that it cannot depend on any other country, even its great friend, the United States, for its own security. So we have to take seriously concerns in Israel. But the fact is, partly due to American military and intelligence assistance, which my administration has provided at unprecedented levels. Israel can defend itself against any conventional danger, whether from Iran directly or from its proxies. On the other hand, a nuclear-armed Iran changes that equation. And that's why this deal ultimately must be judged by what it achieves on the central goal of preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Over the last couple of weeks, I have repeatedly challenged anyone opposed to this deal to put forward a better, plausible alternative. I have yet to hear one. What I've heard instead are the same types of arguments that we heard in the run-up to the Iraq War. Iran cannot be dealt with diplomatically. We can take military strikes without significant consequences. We shouldn't worry about what the rest of the world thinks, because once we act, everyone will fall in line. They didn't. President Kennedy warned Americans not to see conflict as inevitable, accommodation as impossible, and communication is nothing more than the exchange of threats. It is time to apply such wisdom. The deal before us doesn't bet on Iran changing. It doesn't require trust. It verifies and requires Iran to forsake a nuclear weapon.